Welcome to Radiologist Headquarters. I'm Dr. Dan Koval, and it's time for five cases in five minutes, musculoskeletal imaging number three. I'm going to show each unknown case slide for about 10 seconds, and feel free to pause and study the images further. I'll then review the findings, reveal the diagnosis, and move to the next case. Ready? Let's go. Case one. What x-ray would you do next? Slide two of two. Okay, so we're looking at a frontal view of the ankle, and you can see that there's widening of the medial ankle mortise here. There's also soft tissue swelling overlying the medial malleolus. The deltoid ligament is here, and this tells you that there's a ligamentous disruption. So when you see widening of the medial ankle mortise, you want to make sure there's not a fracture involving the fibula more superiorly. So looking at this tibia and fibula x-ray from the same patient, you can see indeed there is a fracture here of the mid-fibula. It's slightly comminuted on the lateral view. So this combination is known as a Maisonneuve fracture. So this refers to a combination fracture that usually involves the proximal to mid fibula with an associated unstable ankle injury from ligamentous disruption. So you'll get widening of the ankle mortis, you might even get a fracture of the medial malleolus, and you get disruption of the distal tibiofibular syndesmosis. And it's basically an eversion injury. It's caused by pronation external rotation. And it's important because these may need internal fixation, and they can also be overlooked clinically. What happens is you get this external rotation force to the ankle and that extends up through the interosseous membrane and then exits through the proximal fibular fracture. So just something to be aware of when you're looking at an ankle x-ray and you see widening of that medial ankle mortise. All right, case two, side one of two. Slide two of two. Okay, so we've got a frontal view of the forearm here, and this is a skeletal image of a patient. So you can see that the growth plates, the physes, are open. So this is a pediatric patient, and on this view, we don't really see anything, which is a little scary, but that's a general rule with fractures, especially in pediatric patients. You may only see them on two views or even one view. Now, if we look at the lateral views that this patient also had, there was some difficulty with positioning, but you can see the fracture here going right through the growth plate of the distal radius. Here's the normal growth plate and epiphysis of the distal ulna, but here we can see the epiphysis is slipped at the level of this growth plate fracture. Here as well, you can see on this lower image the fracture of the growth plate. So this is a Salter-Harris type 1 fracture. So these only occur in children, and they represent fractures that involve the physis. They may go into or across or through the physis, but they always involve the physis in some way. And they're often just called Salter fractures. Sorry, Harris. <laughs> so is the type 1 fracture the most common Salter fracture? No, it's actually the type 2 is by far the most common. That's about 75% of Salter fractures. And there's a handy mnemonic you can remember for the different types of the Salter fracture. And the mnemonic is Salter, S-A-L-T-R. So type 1 is slip. That's what the S stands for. That's involving only the growth plate. Type 2 is above, A. That would be when you have just a metaphysis involved extending into the growth plate. L is lower, so that would involve the epiphysis in the growth plate. That's type 3. Type 4 is together, that's what the T stands for when you have both the metaphysis and the epiphysis involved across the growth plate. And then type 5 isn't very common either, that's when the growth plate is ruined, it's a compression or crush fracture across the growth plate. So S-A-L-T-R, Salter. So often for the lower Salter categories, if they're uncomplicated, they may do well with just casting, and internal fixation is required for the higher Salter fracture categories. In this case, though, we had displacement of the epiphysis at that growth plate fracture, and it required internal fixation. All right, next case, slide one of one. All right, so we've got frontal and lateral views of the lumbar spine, and there are two important findings here. So one is that you have this linear ossification along the midline of the spine here. That's unusual. And then you also have symmetric fusion of the sacroiliac joints to the point where they're barely detectable. So this combination is typical for ankylosing spondylitis. So this is a seronegative spondyloarthropathy, which is a chronic inflammatory disease of unknown etiology, and it primarily affects the spine. And it results in fusion or ankylosis of the spine and the sacroiliac joints. And you can see involvement in other joints as well. So usually the first manifestation is sacroiliitis. And it's typically symmetric and bilateral. Initially you get widening of the joint space at first and then ankylosis. 
And then once the spine gets involved, there are a variety of findings. So the vertebral bodies start to square off in shape. And then you can also get sclerosis and erosions at the corner of the vertebral bodies. And that's known as the shiny corner sign, or also known as Romanus lesions. We don't really have that so much in this case. And then these patients often form syndesmophytes, which is paravertebral ossification that can run parallel to the spine. And when that's severe, it can give you the appearance of a bamboo spine. And then also, which is striking in this case, you can get ossification of the interspinous ligament here, which we're seeing laterally here. Normally there's space in between these spinous processes, but the ligaments are completely ossified. And that gives you this appearance of a dagger sign. See how that kind of looks like a dagger? Or maybe more like a sword, but traditionally it's known as a dagger. <laughs> and then if we look at the CT scan that the patient also had, you can even better see that there's that ossification of the interspinous ligament. So this is giving you that dagger appearance. So classic for ankylosing spondylitis. All right, for a thousand bonus points, which 80s hair metal band had a guitarist that has ankylosing spondylitis? Yes, Motley Crue <laughs> with Mick Mars, but that didn't slow him down, did it? All right, next case, slide one of two. Slide two of two. Okay, so we're looking at a cross table lateral view and here's the patella and the femur and everything looks like it's in normal position. But you see that there's a fluid level here indicating lipohemarthrosis. So this is typically seen when you have an intraarticular fracture and then fat and blood escape from the bone marrow and go into the joint. You'll see this most commonly about the knee as in this case, and it's most typically associated with a tibial plateau fracture or a distal femoral fracture. You can see this in other joints as well. And you'll see this fat fluid level whenever you have a horizontal beam radiograph. So the fact that we have a cross table lateral, we've got a perfectly horizontal surface here. If we look at the front of you, you can see that there is indeed a comminuted fracture of that lateral tibial plateau with some depression there. And typically, CT and MRI have a much higher sensitivity to detect this lipohemarthrosis. And this is the same patient's CT scan. You can see the nice correlation there with the x-ray. Now, if we look at the axial image from the CT, you can see that the fat will float to the surface. That'll be the least dense and the most anterior. And then after that, you get a hematocrit effect. So the blood separates out into serum, which will be the middle layer. And then the red blood cells are actually the heaviest. So those will be the most dependent aspect of the lipohemarthrosis. So you can see it kind of looks like Neapolitan ice cream, right? <laughs> And the CT coronal reformatted image also nicely shows the comminuted depressed tibial plateau fracture. Now it's important to also note though that many tibial plateau fractures actually do not have visible lipohemarthrosis. They might just have hemarthrosis without that fat. So just because you don't see this finding doesn't mean that there's not an intraarticular fracture. All right, final case, 13 year old single slide. Okay, this is an ankle series in a pediatric patient. You can see the growth plates are fused, and we have this cortically-based peripherally sclerotic eccentric lytic lesion, typical for a non-ossifying fibroma, or an NOF. So these are very common. It's actually the most common fibrous bony lesion in children and adolescents, and it peaks around age 10 to 15. This is considered a skeletal don't touch lesion because it has a classic diagnostic appearance and it's completely benign. Most of these require no treatment. If they are large, they put the patient at risk for a pathologic fracture, but one of this size would be of no significance. Now, these are analogous to benign fibrous cortical defects. Generally, cortical defects are less than three centimeters in size and non-ossifying fibromas are greater than three centimeters, but it's the same histology. Also, there are a few syndromes to be aware of when you have multiple non-ossifying fibromas. You can see that in neurofibromatosis type 1, or NF1, also in fibrous dysplasia, and then jaffe Campanacci syndrome. And they're most common in the knee and the distal tibia. And they'll have this appearance where they'll be cortically base, eccentric, and early on they'll be more lytic with a thin sclerotic margin, and over time the margin becomes more thick and sclerotic, and it eventually becomes entirely sclerotic and remodels to normal bone. So that's why we don't typically even see these in patients 30 years and older. But again, this is a leave-alone lesion. All right, let's do a rapid review of those cases. So case one was the Maisonou fracture. That's when you have a disruption of the medial ankle mortise or even a medial malleolar fracture. And you want to evaluate for a proximal fibular fracture because you've got disruption of the distal tibial fibular syndesmosis. The Salter type 1 fracture involves the growth plate. The most common Salter fracture is a type 2 fracture. Remember to look at all views carefully in a pediatric x-ray. Case 3, ankylosing spondylitis. We have the dagger sign caused by interspinous ligament ossification. 
Also, usually the initial sign is fusion of the sacroiliac joints due to symmetric sacroiliitis. Other findings to be aware of are squaring of the vertebral bodies, romanus lesions or shiny corner sign, and the bamboo spine when you have the thin bridging sedesmophytes. Case 4, lipohemarthrosis and tibial plateau fracture. Remember, you'll see that on the cross-table lateral view with fat on the surface and then the hematocrit effect with serum and red blood cells separating out. This is a clue that you have an intraarticular fracture. In the final case, non-ossifying fibroma greater than 3 centimeters, peripherally sclerotic, centrally lucent, eccentric, and cortically based. These will gradually ossify over time, and this is a benign lesion that you can just leave alone, most commonly in patients ages 10 to 15. All right, that's it for five cases in five minutes, MSK imaging number three. I really hope that you enjoyed this lecture, and if so, please subscribe to Radiologist Headquarters on Apple Podcasts and YouTube. It would be really great if you share these lectures with even just one person or left a podcast review. You can also comment or question on YouTube and visit Radiologist HQ for more info and to get updates on social media. Thanks and have a great day.